Well, good morning, everybody. I guess I'm entitled to say welcome to Georgetown uh, now that I'm here officially as well. I um, must tell you that it feels like a little bit of a reunion for me this morning to see so many with whom I have worked over the years who are uh, in the trenches doing so much good work. Um, I want to thank Ben and Agora Partnerships uh, for the leadership that they provide uh, every day, uh, but particularly for bringing everybody together for this impact investing in action. And I want to thank uh, Ladan and the folks at the Entrepreneurship Center and the Business School uh, here at Georgetown for their collaboration in all of this. I'm really decide, delighted to be here as uh, we are about to usher in an extraordinary panel on building the ecosystem for women in Latin America. Each of the panelists is a giant in her own right. Uh, women who know what entrepreneurship uh, can do uh, when women are moving that entrepreneurship forward uh, and the kind of change it can bring to their societies. And I particularly want to mention Shelley Porges, who's on the panel, who was one of my former colleagues at the uh, State Department and who really led the way uh, in many ways in ensuring uh, that these issues were on the State Department agenda. You know, when President Obama appointed me to be the first United States ambassador for global women's issues, it was in some ways like impact investing, to change the paradigm of how we think about and address our 21st century priorities and challenges, to have greater impact. In your case, to contribute to solving social challenges using the power of business. In the case of making women's issues a cornerstone of United States foreign policy, the reasons were also clear. No country can get ahead if it leaves half of its people behind. And there is no way that our collective quest for security, for prosperity and stability can be realized if we don't invest in women, one of the most effective and powerful forces for reshaping the globe. And doing so is not just the right thing to do, which it fundamentally is, but it is the smart and strategic thing to do, which is in many reasons why this whole issue is on the agenda here at this conference. Because we know that investing in women and girls is one of the best investments uh, that can be made for poverty alleviation and for the general prosperity of a country. One of the biggest problems we face in this hemisphere and all over the world is how to grow economies and ensure shared prosperity for all. Secretary Clinton answered that question in a keynote address she made at the APEC uh, meeting two years ago on women and the economy when she said, to achieve the economic expansion we all seek, we need to unlock a vital source of growth that can power our economies for decades to come. And the source of that power is women. Today, there is a volume of data to buttress the proposition that women drive economic growth and that women's economic activity is vital. No doubt many of you have studied, analyzed, and published the research and data. As you know, the World Economic Forum, no women's organization to be sure, publishes an annual gender gap report. Now, why do they look country by country at how great the gap is between men and women in each country on four metrics, health, access to education, economic participation, and political empowerment. Because 
in those countries where that gap is closer to being closed, and in no country is it closed, but where it is closer to being closed, where it is moving in the right direction, those countries are far more economically competitive uh, and far more prosperous. The case for unlocking the potential of women and including them more fully in the economic lives of our nations begins with acknowledging how women already are driving growth. The economists not too long ago pointed out that the increase in women's economic participation in the developed countries during the past decade has added more to global growth and economic prosperity than China has. We also know something that I think is particularly important, and that is <clears throat> that women's economic activity yields a double dividend because women invest upwards of 90% of their income in their families and their communities. This means investments in food, in education, in health, all of which has a multiplier effect and constitutes an investment in raising the standard of living. Women are also the growing consumer market, so they are the producers and the consumers, and this is why uh, investors pay so much attention uh, to this space of economic activity. <clears throat> Globally, uh, women, according to the Boston Consulting Group, will control $28 trillion in spending by next year, and by 2028, they will be responsible for about two-thirds of consumer spending around the world. Studies also show that women-run SMEs are accelerators of growth. You know, in the United States, women-owned businesses contribute nearly three trillion to our economy, and they are growing at more than double the rate of all firms. And if this trend holds, women entrepreneurs will generate more than five million jobs over the next six years. This is why when the 21 APEC economies came together, and that includes Mexico, Peru, Chile, Canada, and the United States from this hemisphere, when they came together two years ago in San Francisco, uh, and then subsequently in Russia, and this fall they will come together again in Indonesia, the San Francisco Declaration that was adopted was adopted to lower those barriers and increase economic opportunities, particularly for women entrepreneurs. Because everywhere, uh, women are hindered in their ability to start a business or to grow a business. Uh, and we know this. I'm sure each and every one of us sitting here knows what the challenges are. They are often hindered because they lack access to training or to the kind of mentors who can guide them to the success point uh, in their enterprises. Uh, they lack the kind of uh, networks that enable them to um, take advantage of trade agreements and so much more that uh, they need to know as they can uh, grow those businesses. They need access to markets, which is why so much creative work is going on today, particularly in the realm of the bigger companies who want to spin off their supply chain uh, increasingly to women-run enterprises and imagine how that grows the success of those enterprises but they have to be certified as capable of producing high quality products and services and ensuring a sustainable stream of those services uh, for the market uh, that is created. But the biggest challenge, which I hear everywhere, including in this country, uh, is access to finance. And so we have been working in this space, the State Department has, and other partners in the United States government to create and leverage regional platforms to increase women's entrepreneurship, 
access to markets and capital, training and networks. We've leveraged resources of regional development banks like IDB, and I'm so pleased to see that they are part of this uh, conference. We've partnered with them. We've partnered significantly with the private sector to maximize assistance to women entrepreneurs. We launched Pathways to Prosperity in El Salvador four years ago to accelerate women's economic activity and to integrate it into the regional objectives of advancing social justice and inclusiveness, growing economic opportunity, spreading the benefits of trade much more widely. In this hemisphere, as you all know very well, we've certainly seen progress in terms of increased economic activity and growth, particularly what that rep has represented for reductions in poverty. The trend lines are moving in the right direction. And as Secretary Clinton noted in one of her very last uh, foreign travel uh, in her position as secretary, that was when she went to the conference on power, women as drivers of economic growth and social inclusion that took place in Lima late last year and was co-sponsored by IDB, by the United States government and Peru with wide participation, perhaps some of you from across Latin America. Latin America and the Caribbean have steadily increased women's participation in the labor market and as entrepreneurs, which is now above 50%. Between 2000 and 2010, it grew by 15%. And it is well stated that had it not been for this decade of growth and participation, the World Bank has estimated that extreme poverty in the region would today be 30% higher. So what you are all about is so significantly important. But it is also true that in Latin America, according to the UN, some of the greatest internal economic disparities exist. <clears throat> today there is a greater focus than ever on women's economic participation and particularly their role in growing uh, SMEs. Because as the World Bank has told us, SMEs are the missing middle. We've invested in microcredit and microenterprise and we need to continue to do that and it has an amazing track record in lifting the poorest of the poor. And we know what the high end of global economic investment represents. But that missing middle, the SMEs, the drivers of growth, uh, is where women's entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs in general find their place. That is why at the Summit of the Americas that took place last year, the United States launched what we called the Women's Entrepreneurship in the Americas program, or we called it We Americas to take on those barriers, one by one, that stand in the way of women's entrepreneurial success. And we did this as a public-private partnership. Governments were involved, big companies were involved, like Walmart and ExxonMobil. The IDB was involved. NGOs like We Connect and Vital Voices were involved. And together, uh, this impressive group of collaborators uh, committed uh, to uh, helping women across the Americas develop their leadership skills, their business skills, and to be part of the kind of vibrant network uh, that will have the kinds of payoffs each and every one of us wants to see. I was also very impressed uh, at Davos earlier this year uh, when there was a presentation by Mexico on what it was doing in terms of a commitment it had made in conjunction with the World Economic Forum to in more significant ways tap its female population to move from the informal economy into the formal economy. Uh, and more and more there is a growing recognition uh, across the world uh, and by governments increasingly 
uh, that this is where they need to invest if the kinds of jobs and better futures for their people are going to become a reality. The IDB has said, without a date, doubt, women joining the workforce and becoming entrepreneurs will improve the overall efficiency of a country, whether developed or developing. Access to capital is perhaps the most significant challenge. And so the IDB has been working to develop innovative lending models uh, to spur growth in SME owned, for SMEs owned by women, and working to help regional banks expand their lending. And I'm sure many of you in this space know that there's a lot of creative work going on today in terms of uh, collateral, what, what uh, other um, assets uh, or experiences can be tapped, uh, loan guarantee programs, uh, but investment capital for early stage companies is an extraordinary need. Uh, and those of you here who are in this space addressing this need are truly on the cutting edge of the kind of powerful force, uh, certainly growing profits, but at the same time creating that incredible social uh, impact, social difference, to address some of those critical challenges. So I hope you will do all that you can do uh, to really make a difference in this critical way. When I was in Peru for that conference just a few months ago, I met Luzmila Huaranca. She made beautiful embroidered cloth from the Andean highlands, which she had displayed uh, in one section of the conference room. Like so many indigenous women, she had never had an opportunity for a formal education. But in her case, about 10 years ago, she and her husband got a boost from USAID, or it could have been from another uh, investor in skills development and the kind of uh, supports one needs in this case. And this boost helped them turn their skills into a small business. They grew it and were able to create the kind of women-run enterprise that today uh, is winning all kinds of awards. She supplies international textile markets. She has a trained network of more than 800 women in dozens of communities uh, to make her product. And sure enough, when I was in the airport and saw the big shop, what was hanging there were those beautiful tapestries. She is one example. There are Luzmilas all over Latin America, all over our world. Hers was an early stage business struggling for support and just look where it is today. In a macro way, the CEO of Coca-Cola summed all of this up. That company has made an investment in an in initiative called 5 by 20 to create 5 million new female entrepreneurs by the year 2020. And when Mutar Kent was asked why, why would this multi-million dollar investment be made? He said, the only way a projected billion people will rise to the middle class in the next 10 years, the only way the world will grow richer economically, the only way nations will rise out of poverty and become politically stable will be by achieving gender parity on a global scale. He said, if we fail, the whole world economy will fail. So I encourage all of you to go about thinking through for-profit solutions to the world's great social and environmental challenges, particularly in the region, and to apply, to apply a gender lens to your thinking. Because if you do, 
I know you will have significantly strengthened and multiplied the social impact of your work and your bottom line as well. So thank you all so much.